you all, most welcome to uh, this um, lecture, seminar, you make it for what you want it to be, uh, which is part of uh, the celebrations of uh, this university's long and enduring existence. And the law faculty will want to play in uh, with an intervention into the brain week, uh, discussions which normally take place beyond our disciplinary limits. Uh, but we have been engaged now with recent developments which are intensely related to progress in research on the functioning of the human brain, research which is not necessarily very novel. Uh, the brunt of it has been ongoing since the 1960s, but it's been speeding up in recent years, and that has enabled weapons developments which we as international lawyers are interested in. And I've been doing research on that. My name is Gregor Moll. I'm the Chair of International Law, Professor of International Law at this faculty. And I've been working on the question of neurotechnological research uh, since the past three or four years. I've been publishing on it as well. That research is ongoing. I enjoy the benefit of working within a group of our uh, legal researchers, international lawyers, and we are seeking to uh, scan uh, what kind of weapons developments are uh, proposed by various teams uh, in various contexts that are making use of neurotechnological uh, advances. So here we are um, for, for kind of collecting our thinking on that matter. Uh, we devised a neologism, a new word, neuroweapons, combining neurotechnology and weapons. And in a few minutes, I hope to convince you that it's good to think in those terms. And you might be thinking that, well, um, you international lawyers looking at a uh, great field of, of performing research within and thinking about the problems that emerge in the field of law. Okay, um, if you looked at the, uh, uh, the, the, the um, abstract for this lecture, um, the title of this lecture it seems to be about two things. What are neuroweapons and are they lawful? So here are the two questions uh, that I want to pursue here. The first part is what is a neuroweapon? I would like to tell you a bit about the uh, um, neurotechnological background to recent developments uh, uh, in, in weapon applications. I would like to tell you about the problem the military is having, at least since the late 1990s, with an abundance of images and too few humans that can um, look at those images and analyze them. And I can thereafter tell you a bit about the developments in funding research in the area uh, of neurotechnology and weapons developments, uh, which brought us to a couple of articles in scientific journals that tell us about these experimental systems. None of them, to, to our knowledge, has been fielded yet, but we see that things are moving in a direction that could bring them to practical application, to practical use, within, let's say, five or 10 years or so. And there, I would say, the point of thinking about them politically is now, not in five or 10 years, because when it's too late, the investments will have been made. If we want to influence um, the, uh, uh, the lawmakers or the states that are making investments into those systems, the time is now. So we have to sit down now and think about what is going on and does the law, is the law uh, suitable uh, capturing and regulating these developments or do we have to make a kind of a political intervention into that? So, Good. Um, and after having told you, given you three concrete examples of neurotechnological applications in the military field, I would like to turn to the second question. Is a neuroweapon lawful? And um, my first answer will be yes, but my second answer will be, well, perhaps not. 
and I'll give you reasons for that. Uh, the second part will be more technical um, for those of you who are not lawyers, but I hope to be fairly uh, simple in my explanations, and to the extent I'm not, feel free to interrupt me and say, hey, wait a moment, that was a piece of lingo, please, could you take that again in a kind of a worldly language, which even my lawyers understand. Is that agreed that you would feel free to interrupt me when I'm not making sense to you? Good, I see you nodding, great. So let's go ahead. <coughs> let's now imagine a situation where all of a sudden we see a snake slithering across the room. And we're thinking, oh my god, it's a snake. And it might be a poisonous snake. We might want to get out of here. And there are quite a few of us in the room we do not want to step on each other when evacuating the room, and least of all, we, want to, we don't want to step onto the snake. Now, before you even think in terms of, oh my god, there's a snake in the room, there has been an unconscious perception of something slithering that might be dangerous. And that unconscious perception, let's call it like that, is coming much earlier than the conscious thought Oh my god, there's a snake in the room, it's dangerous, I better get out. So, um, you have uh, this unconscious perception sending a readiness signal to the relevant parts of your, uh, of your body, your muscles, very, very fast, within a, a number of milliseconds. And only thereafter, after a couple of more milliseconds passing, um, this image will uh, surface in your consciousness and you will start to think about what this image means in terms of your reaction. The good thing is, at that stage, your body is already, already prepared to run. There's been this readiness, readiness signal uh, that has been alerting your muscles, so your muscles are in a much better shape, so to say, in order to uh, take action, to get out of here, to run to the door, or whatever. So, there's time involved in that, and there is unconsciousness involved in that. Now imagine, if your problem is, as a military person, to do things fast before your enemy does things. Time is a very, very interesting asset. Uh, if we could get to that unconscious reaction that reaction that sends a readiness signal to our muscles and use it in a weapon system, that would be very, very interesting. Because what do you do if you are a warfighting state that develops novel weapons? You want to be first with the latest. You want to put a weapon system out into the field that your enemy does not have. And you want to be able to move faster with that weapon system than what the enemy is able to do. So, therefore, um, neurological research, the workings of the brain are interesting to developers of defense systems, as they would be called, to weapons. Now, as you probably will know, we have had our technology based on what is going on in the brain electrochemical processes since the 1960s. You might all be aware of at least images of uh, electroencephalograms being made of, of human beings and their brain processes. Uh, a person sitting uh, on a chair with a lot of sensors attached to that of that person which in turn are going to a kind of machine which tracks the ongoings of the brain. Since the 1960s, we know that looking at images or perceiving an image like what is around us uh, does things in the brain that can be tracked, uh, for example, by EEGs. Uh, so this technology and this knowledge is fairly old. Now, Let's move from the 1960s to the 1990s, uh, where the US military had this problem of having too much intelligence, too good systems that would take 
images, photographs, videos, capture data, and bring them to what is called intelligence and analysts. People who look at images in order to detect things that are interesting. For example, pieces of artillery or bridges which are needed for troops to pass across, or hidden tanks, or airfields, or such like. So the systems for acquiring images were getting more and more productive. There were more and more images, but not necessarily more and more analysts. Take that into uh, the noughties uh, after 2001. Uh, you had an augmented investment into that kind of uh, imagery systems. The drones went up on a massive scale and complemented satellites and manned uh, aircraft in acquiring photographs and videos from uh, so-called uh, uh, battle theaters, uh, the battlefield. So you would have all this imagery <coughs> landing uh, with an army, an air force, and a navy that, that couldn't necessarily compute it with humans because you have the images going up. Uh, we have an example between 2001 and 2010, I think. Uh, there were 3,500% more images to be processed by the US Army. So it's a massive increase. If you look at the budget of uh, the US military at large, you can do that in CIPRI's yearbook on CIPRI's website and get an impression. You see, well, there's not um, a massive increase. It's more or less the same until 2012 and then there's a dip and now there's probably an increase again. But it's nothing that uh, would give us the impression, well, yes, the military can actually put a lot of human beings out there who would analyze those images. So you have invested into these systems that bring you all these great images that could be used to your advantage if you were a US military decision maker, if you only had the image analysts, but you haven't, not to the degree you would be. So that's like, you want to go back to the 1960s and think in terms of, hey, wait a minute, we have these people who could tell us something about the workings of the brain, and probably, hmm, they could tell us whether we could combine the human brain, which seems to be so good and so fast at image processing, much faster than what a computer would be, because that's a fact, actually. We're still better at certain things, and image processing is one of these things. You'll tell me, but look, I'm reading about artificial intelligence and the advances made every day in the papers, and they're getting better and better. Yes. But in terms of image processing, it's still a far cry from our uh, capabilities. So if you would now be able to combine a computer which can do certain things better than what humans can do with a human that can do certain things better than what a machine could do, wouldn't that be a dream to you? Yeah. And that's exactly what neural weapons are, are all about. They're combinations of humans and computers that seek to exploit the advantages of both. Now, let me tell you how that works. Let, let me give you a couple of examples of um, what could be called neural weapons, and let me then try to give <coughs> a definition of sorts, but in of that exemplification, I don't think you will need it. Um, and here I'm looking from, from uh, at a period between 2006 and now, so much has been happening in the last 10, 11, 12 years. And there's one major actor, I'm focusing very much on the US now because the US has been investing heavily into that area and they're relatively transparent on what they're doing. So you can actually, as a person with access to the university library, you can go there and look up many of these articles and get them in full text. So there's no, massive secrecy um, in that. Of course, when these proposals go move on into weapon systems that are deployed in the field, then secrecy prevails. But you can still get an idea, this kind of first developmental stage, where a lot of uh, systems are proposed by researchers, and some of them might capture the interest and imagination of 
uh, persons who are making decisions on what systems to acquire from the material. So let me give you a couple of examples here, uh, tell you about a few systems that have been proposed. Not everything is done by the US. Uh, in 2012, two Iranian researchers proposed a system that would solve the problem of guards falling asleep. I mean, this is mundane. Uh, you put two soldiers out there to guard, guard a compound or, I don't know, a piece of artillery or a tank or something uh, in a battlefield, and they're working long hours, and at the end of the day, they're falling asleep. And you think that you have guarded that military asset, but in reality, you don't. So, these two Iranian, Iranian researchers are proposing a simple system where you are mounting a, 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 a kind of cranial sensors to the head of that guard and by the brainwave, so to say, by the scan of the brainwaves, you can see whether that person has fallen asleep or not. If that person falls asleep, you are alerting somebody who is awake, saying, hey, here's the system we're telling you that your guard has just been falling asleep. That's very simple. But you see that the brunt of the work of image processing is still on the human here. It's a system that's just doing the guarding of the guards. But it shows that this technology is widespread. You don't need to be a state with the defense budget of the US to be able to exploit that technology. Now let's move on to uh, other examples where the US has funded developments uh, through grants uh, given by the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA, kind of famous actor in that field who has quite some money, not as much money as the Army or the Navy or the Air Force, but quite some money to, uh, to, to, to fund projects that have the capability of being the next generation surprise weapons. So to say. Okay, DARPA went and funded a project that led to uh, a publication in 2013 that I really find interesting. Here the problem is, um, that you uh, would like as a military to be able to drive a tank or an armored vehicle through a hostile urban environment. Think Baghdad during the heyday of the US intervention there, for example. So you would want to drive an armed vehicle and you want to, would want to uh, be aware of threats to that armed vehicle, but you would also be, like to be able to seek out uh, targets how do you do that? Today what you do is that you have a human operator um, who has a pan tilt zoom camera. That's a camera that is mounted on the outside of the vehicle and that you can simply um, uh, change the position of and track uh, the surroundings. And that human is looking for threats like uh, wayside bombs or targets like enemy fighters or something like that. That's what we have today. Now, here's this group of researchers. Uh, the article is, is known as a uh, contribution by a person called Turayan and others. So Turayan and his team, um, uh, they're coming along and saying, hey, we can do that better. Uh, we're retaining the camera on the outside of the vehicle, but then things get slightly more complicated. What we do before using the imagery of the camera is that we are developing a system that uh, and that's a computer system that uh, identifies regions of interest. Um, now I think probably I would like to... ...visual systems. Regions of interest, that's the first step. And together with that first step, of course, in order to know what's interesting, are we reaching for the clouds? No, we are not. We are looking for fighters, enemy fighters, and we're looking probably for uh, IEDs, otherwise bombs. Um, so you would also have to have some crude idea of your targets, or what we could call threats. So that's the first task for the programmer, to see too that the camera doesn't film the sky or the closed ground, but is keeping its focus on 
kind of reasonably interesting regions where there might really be threats, houses, streets, such like. So that you have to program that the camera is used in a way that is making sense. And in order um, to do that, you have to, as a program, you have to define the threat in some way. The fun thing in the Turian article, if I may find that funny, is that they used um, the image of a soldier with a gun. Which, of course, if you think of urban warfare with uh, a non-state enemy, that's not really what, um, what the US uh, would, would, would face in terms of, um, of the visual characteristics of the enemy. But that's what they did, do, uh, did just for the sake of the argument. <coughs> So the first step is you design a computer system that governs the camera and that um, when doing so you have to define the target. Good. The second thing uh, you're doing in that system is that you're taking now the soldier and you're adapting the soldier and the system to each other. You're making the system learn how the brain of the soldier functions when seeing images of the target. So you show that image of the armed soldier to, to, uh, uh, to the operator sitting within um, the vehicle. And um, the system is now being made attentive to how um, these electrochemical reactions would look in that individual soldier. If I were to man it, my reactions might be different than your reactions. So what you want to do is now you want to give the system a chance to learn my characteristics. Now those of you who are into artificial intelligence, uh, they, you would immediately recognize that this is a process that we're calling machine learning or deep learning. The point of that is that it's not the programmer who's scripting the whole process. From a certain point, you let the program do work on its own. You ask the program to find out the best solutions in a richness of possible solutions. So I'm emphasizing that because it means that this neural weapon, to some extent, is unmooring, is detaching itself from the program. Are you with me on that point? Because that's an important thing. Good. Great. Um, so what, why did I write AD? I have no idea. It's the problem of being human. Foundation. You're not quite aware of your own intentions. Not all the time. Anyway, yeah, let's call it like that. We're matching system and operator. Oh my god, when I'm looking at it, it sounds incredibly boring, but it's incredibly problematic. The fun thing is that you read these articles and they're presented in this naive way, and like, hey, we, have, we, we did it, we, present, we made up this brain system, look at it, it's working and it's doing its work faster than what a conventional human scanning of all these images would do. That's their point. It's faster. It's so much faster. Now, what's the third step? In, the, in this uh, third step, you would actually uh, get going and uh, start, let the computer vision uh, uh, system uh, process images taken by the cameras from the environment of that, uh, of that vehicle and pre-screen regions of interest. So now camera is on. And you're taking images from these various regions of interest. And let's now uh, uh, think about it in terms of the system taking or doing the dirty work, what is called mowing the lawn in intelligence analysis lingo. That is, you're kind of doing the mass analysis. You are looking at a lot of pictures and you're sorting out the junk, what, what is completely uninteresting. You're trying to get at those images that might contain a threat or a target. Okay, so you let the computer system do the mowing the lawn. And sort out uh, the junk from the interesting stuff. 
Now, you show in the fourth step, the fourth step, you show interesting images to the operator. Are you really showing it to the operator? Well, you are showing it to the operator, but what you're interested in is uh, the neuronal reactions of the operator. You don't want the operator to say, oh, hey, wait a minute, stop everything, there is a soldier over there. You just want the brain of the operator to emit neuronal signals, which you capture. Okay, and as you know, the system has been trained on that person. So the system knows pretty well how uh, a set of signals would look that would be correlated to an image of the enemy. So, whenever there is uh, such an interesting signal that indicates uh, there might be an enemy around, the system shows the image that uh, created a special signal. And in the seventh step, the operator decides whether to fire or not, what action to take. So you see here is a kind of an, uh, there's an interwovenness of human and machine decision making. Uh, what is interesting to me is that uh, when you're an operator and you announce step seven, the system says, hey, wait a minute, you told us that in this image there was a target. Now, what do you think? Do you think that you're retaining your sovereignty in such a moment and saying, hey, um, let's look at this picture as if I hadn't had the information from the system. Oh, I can't really see a target in that. Well, that looks pretty much like a civilian, not so much as a soldier. Uh, that's a woman with a broom rather than a man with a gun to make this completely gender insensitive. Um, or would you think, oh, wait a minute, the system tells me something about my brain's reaction. And as I know that this unconscious reaction of the brain is linked to dangerous, I might believe the system more than my own conscious reaction. Are you with me? So there's a standoff built into the system while well, you as an operator, when you're making a conscious decision, you have to um, weigh uh, your conscious reactions against what the system tells you about your unconscious reaction. Now, if you in that situation think that, oh, there has been a lot of research going into that, uh, what do I know? I'm just a poor soldier, I have no idea. Um, I better trust the system, because this is actually the context I'm set to work in. Then you're starting to lose it. Then you're actually starting to withdraw as a human taking responsibility for the role you're playing in the decision. But if you say, yeah, okay, my task is to double check things from the beginning as if I were a judge of a higher court looking at the decision of a lower court completely from the beginning and consider how this would look to me. Then, of course, you're emphasizing the human judgmental capabilities, and you are hmm, displaying a fair degree of distrust into the system. Okay, let's now think, these people are soldiers, let's think what they are tasked to do, and that's of course playing a role as well. But I'm not going to say at this stage already that, oh my god, this is going to be catastrophic, it's not going to work. But the way I put it to you, of course, you see that there is a degree of skepticism as a lawyer who's looking for human involvement in order to make the law stick to the situation. I'm of course very interested in how you are conditioning the decision making of the human being. Good. That was the second example. I had the Iranian developers of the sentry system. I had to Ryan, whose problem was to, to, uh, um, to, to make a, a, an armored vehicle move through a city without being, uh, well, and while finding threats and, and 
targets. And then there's a third uh, piece of research <coughs> which came in 2015 that basically uses the same technology, the same setup, which seems to be become a standard of sorts, and uses it in, an, in a, a naval environment where the problem is that mm, when you want to secure uh, ships, warships, um, they might be threatened by a lot of mines. So what you do today is you have a poor human person who sits and looks at a lot of imagery from sonars um, who are kind of an underwater image production device. And um, they're trying to see, uh, oh yeah, this sonar image displays the, displays the signature of something that could be a mine. This is dangerous, we have to take action. Oh, no, this is not a mine, this is something else which is not dangerous at all. Now, you will want to automatize that. Um, there's been a lot of work going into artificial intelligence, trying to solve that problem. It hasn't worked at all, or hasn't worked very well. Uh, now, there's a gang of researchers in 2015 proposing a system, uh, putting together humans and computers in the same way, works better, speeds up detection. So. It's a great thing. So if you would be DARPA, this agency investing into breakthrough military technologies, you would be very content. Ten years after we started the first programs, this is finally uh, paying, paying off. There's another, and that's my last example. I've been talking about one operator now. Now imagine that you, we all put on bath caps and we all uh, link ourselves up to computers or one huge computer and we're all looking at the same images. Might be the case that I'm not seeing something in that image, but you are seeing something, you are seeing something, you are seeing something, you are not seeing anything, you are not seeing anything. But the whole, that part of the room is seeing something in that image. So by pooling ourselves, we can actually increase the speed and accuracy of our image analysis. Um, that's the last example that persons, then actually we're doing still that. Now you'll already have thought about that, but that means of course to, uh, that the decision-making process is taking out of the individual body and into something that is a collective, however we're going to imagine that. Law, in order to work, needs individuals. We need individuals um, in order to say that was a criminal act or that was an act prohibited by international law that engenders a kind of responsibility of a collective body called the state. So we're in trouble when we hear that. We're already thinking about, oh my God, that's going to be very, very messy to take this whole group of persons and figure out who of them might be responsible for anything bad that happened due to their collective judgment that Yes, there was an enemy out there on that image. You can bomb that location, and at the end it turns out, no, it wasn't an enemy, it wasn't a combatant, it was a civil. So warfare stakes are high. These decisions, individually made or collectively made, they have a huge impact on the ground. If you are doing that within human, traditional human structures in the military, you know that you have a hierarchy and at the end, the commander bears the responsibility. Now, if we're just pooling ourselves to a brain-machine interface, as these things are called, we're, of course, quite flat hierarchically. And the system, as proposed by Stoica, doesn't make any distinction between the various analysts. Their, their brains are all part of a larger organism, so to speak. That's very, very interesting. I'm not going to... Um, look at the collective dimension, I'm just flagging for it as a problem right now. And uh, as time moves, I'd like to move on to the question of lawfulness. Instead, taking the example of um, this individual weapon system, uh, which is a bit easier to think about uh, for us lawyers. At, uh, at okay. Now let's think about the lawfulness question. Are neural weapons lawful, the second and last part of my intervention today? Now, um, let's do our homework. There's no international treaty that says that these novel systems are unlawful. Uh, it's not the case that you have something like the Ottawa Convention that prohibits a certain type of mines. 
from being uh, used and killed. It. Uh, it's not because um, we have a process going on as we have uh, now with regard to nuclear weapons, which would outlaw their, their use on the international law. Let's see how this process ends up. We haven't seen the end of it. But there is nothing like a particular targeted process on these weapons uh, by, by the makers of international law, which are states after all. So we need to go to general rules. And the good thing about the law uh, applicable to this field is it's, it's incredibly simple. And even without being a lawyer, you might already know it from your reading of media. Um, you basically have two norms. One is called the principle of distinction. You have to distinguish between combatants and civilians. That's people who are fighting the war and people who are bystanders in very simple terms. And you can make that norm more complicated by, for example, saying you can't bomb hospitals and so on and so on. Uh, but let's keep it very simple. You are not to kill civilians, but you may indeed harm and kill combatants. That is enemy soldiers. The second norm, um, perhaps not as simple, but well known at least, is the principle of proportionality. You are not to carry out an attack which harms a disproportionate number of civilians. What's disproportionate? It's something that exceeds the military advantage you're getting out of the attack. And now you would like, you would like to know probably how to figure out that? Do you have a special formula? No, we don't. We have a group of trained military lawyers that are having a kind of a hunch of what is proportionate and what is not proportionate. If you have international media reporting on an attack, the threshold of proportionality might be higher. And if you don't have international media uh, uh, reporting on it, on attack, but those are questions, those are already entering into the fine print of the proportionality principle. But on a kind of a, on a very, very simple level, you just have these two norms with which you can do a lot of work. And of course, if you look at them, uh, you think that, oh, they seem to be premised on human activity, both of them. In particular, the principle of pro proportionality seems to be um, pivoting on a form of human judgment. Now enter the technologist, Ron Arkin, from the Georgia Institute of Technology, saying, oh, no problem, we can build a system, we can build an artificial intelligence system that is much better at obeying the laws of war than what a human would be. Because our system isn't bent on revenge for a body killed. Our system isn't bent to react differently under the stress of fighting a, an actual battle. It's always going to react consistently with the laws of war. So there are people are telling us that there are technological solutions to them. Now, let that matter rest. Let me now focus on uh, lawfulness of this particular combination of a human who is basically borrowing her or his brain to a weapons system. So I said that as a matter of special norms, there's Nothing there, they're lawful. As a matter of general rules like distinction and proportionality, well, you could say if you use them the right way in a responsible way, they should very well be lawful. So at that stage, when I'm thinking, I thought that far, I thought probably it's just me ans asking the question in the wrong way. If I'm asking about lawfulness, I will get a positive answer. I will get this kind of answer if the system is used in a responsible way, no problem for uh, us lawyers. But if I ask things differently, if I, instead of asking about the gadget, the weapon, I'm asking about the human who is involved in it, who is part of its use, then the question might be different. Then the question is, is the law capable of applying to that human in a situation where the system is used? So let's not look too much at the gadget, the objects of warfare. Let's look rather at the role that the human is be being is taking in that, uh, in that situation. And then suddenly things get very, very dark indeed. And we've reached the dark side of neurotechnology. Because if you for a moment forget about 
the technological stuff and think about the law. What does the law intend on doing? Well, it wants to regulate, to a very large degree, human behavior in the world. And in order to do that kind of regulation, it tries to impact on our intentions. It tries to make us want to behave lawfully and make us uh, not want to behave unlawfully. So it seems to be interacting all the time with our consciousness. Because intent, or so at least the lawyer believes, is something that at least also touches upon our consciousness. So if you look now at what criminal law, which is a kind of a mainstay behind giving the laws of war some kind of a force in the world, if you are a commander and you are uh, giving orders to attack civilians, you are actually making yourself liable to criminal prosecution. That's something which is a war crime. It can be prosecuted by a court in your home state or internationally. But in order for that court to be able to prosecute you, two things need to be in place. There has to be an act which is criminalized, attacking civilians. That's prohibited. But you have to have a state of mind with that commander that is correlating to that act. So you have to have a commander wanting to give that order to attack civilians. That is called, and per, uh, uh, forgive me for this use of Latin lingo here, that is called mens rea. Mens is linked to mental, so it's the thing of the mind if you so on. want. As a prosecutor, as a lawyer, you want to find that state of mind with the accused person. Now, let's go back to this. How do we know what the state of mind of that operator is? That's very tricky indeed. When you're integrating a weapon system and a human being to the degree where you're having a hard time at delineating where the human starts and the system stops, and where the system stops and the human starts, You'll make life very, very hard for a prosecutor that shall put weight behind international criminal law and the laws of war. Are you with me? So the very developed, the way, very way this is so neatly interwoven with, with each other, the system learning about the features of the operator, telling the operator that we just saw something in you that indicates the presence of a target here. Aren't you convinced? Let's take a decision now. That's, of course, very difficult. If I were the accused in such a case, I would say, hey, it wasn't me who decided, it was the system who decided. It just used my brainwaves. And my brainwaves are not identical with me. And they're surely not identical with the state of my mind. Because, I would argue, as the accused, the mind is something different than the brain. This is standard Cartesianism. Uh, Descartes is one of the founding fathers of the way we're thinking in science. So you would have a good argument for the defense here. And what happens if we have operators that are able to defend themselves in that way, helped by crafty lawyers, of course? Well, it's actually that they would go free, and that the states operating <coughs> these systems that would harm civilians in, in the long run, they would go free as well, because in order to make a state responsible, you need to show that the soldiers sent into a military conflict made themselves liable to war crimes. So this whole chain is breaking down before my eyes because uh, the developers of neurotic weapons pulled the rug from human consciousness and therewith human intent. And therewith, the only criteria I, I also, one of two criteria I need to show as a prosecutor in order to make the law apply to a person and to, as the case, penalize a person who is violating them. So there we are. We can make that story more complicated. I could throw articles at you. I could show you that there are provisions in international and the laws of war that are forcing states to do reviews of new weapon systems, but to no avail because you're always running into the same arguments by states that let's see how that works out in practice. 
uh, let's not hasten to a judgment here. And be, uh, most important of all, let's not put a lock onto a technological development because that is making us unable to defeat our enemies. This Cartesian argument, is it really uh, applicable? The, the number seven there is still the operator decides if I were to stab someone and say well my brother told me to or well I dreamt that that was the right thing to do well, it would not be a valid defense no, no. so why would it be in case in point seven there right. now it depends on your assumptions it depends on whether um, just as a footnote, I don't think it's a Cartesian argument. Okay. It's a wrong understanding. Yeah, okay. but I, don't, I don't know, but no, I think yeah. the difference to um, well, my brother told me, mm. but it was wrong in that case. It wasn't a case of self-defense or another legitimate uh, reason for uh, being free of responsibility. Um, the thing is, if you, know, you as an operator can show that you had good reasons to trust the system, you will personally be free from legal responsibility. Do you have reasons to trust your brother? Do you think so? I think so. You think so? <laughs> That's good. Congratulations for having such a trustworthy brother. But there might be situations where a judge would say, well, look, um, you, you can't take your brother as an eternity, yeah. as an authority in all walks yeah, of life. Yeah. Yeah. The situation might be different for an operator who is under orders mm -hmm. to make Herself, himself available to the machine, and mm. who's probably assured that, look, this is a very sophisticated machine and it works very well. Uh, mm. A lot of scientists have developed it, so it's going to be all right. Um, let's see how good use you can make of that. I would think it would be a different setting where a judge would be impressed by the argument that the way the system makes use of the operator's brain But with that uh, reasoning, then you could just as well take away 0.7, or what? Because if the, it's if not the, a real if the, if, the, if, the, yeah. if the system is that trustable, whatever. Right, right. No, and here, of course, you are, you are pointing us to the important and the tricky part of this whole setup. There is a 0.7. It's not the case that, um, in the interest of speed, the developers have said, well, it's actually enough that the system detects mm. this special signal and then mm. gives the order to shoot, because that would save us a fair couple of milliseconds mm -hmm. still. Um, we want a human in the loop. And here we get actually to uh, I, what I think is a widespread misunderstanding that militaries seek autonomous systems that are cutting out the humans from the loop. loop. The opposite is the case. We have statements by high-ranking persons in the US military saying, we always want a human in the loop. We can understand that, because if you're a military person, of course you want to be the person that can do things with the military machinery. You don't want the military machinery to do things on its own. You want to maintain some kind of ultimate control um, of the machinery. But the question is, of course, whether that extends to being erring on the cautious side when it comes to uh, your capability of quickly analyzing images and winning a conflict on the case. So I, I'm not saying that, oh, this can never work, but I, I can say um, that if this errs in a kind of an obvious way, I think we're safe, because then the operator will catch it or the superior will say, this is not working well, we can't use that system. But if it's um, making errors in a medium term in a time frame, then I think it's much harder to detect the differences that a uh, decision supported by such a system would make compared to a, a, a decision system which is wholly human, which is only manned by humans. That's a bit the problem that we are having in medium term. Uh, military processes, it's very hard to understand the differences between alternative A or alternative B. Here, it concerns the involvement of human beings and now the possibility to apply the law, which is what I'm concerned about. You had a question too. Yeah, um, the way I thought about it was that neuroweapons is sort of the bridge 
towards simply using AI or only using AI. Yeah. So the reason you use step seven is because machine learning isn't good enough yet. Yeah. But that's not only the case. You said you want humans in the loops as well for caution reasons or for ultimate control reasons. Yeah. I think the general also wants to forever wants to be in the loop. Uh, but when you're moving to the intermediate and lower ranks, I'm not sure that there is the same interest. But you would like to show, in terms of your compliance with the law, that there's always a human in the loop somewhere. Okay. There have been efforts earlier where saying, well, there's a human on the loop, like a human overseeing that these processes are basically pursued properly. Um, but what I see in the more recent utterances is that we are assured by um, uh, very high-ranking U.S. Uh, commanders that now we want to be in the loop. It's not a question of seeking autonomy. There's always going to be human involvement, even if we are developing platforms that are so-called autonomous. There's always going to be control over that. And I'm, uh, early on, I thought, well, it's perhaps just that they want to make the point that they're capable of obeying the law. Um, but then again, I'm also thinking that mm, uh, there seems to be a massive discursive effort right now to say that, well, the public might be worried about these Terminator scenarios, but they're barking up the wrong tree. It's not that kind of t technology we're seeking. Uh, it's a different type of technology that exploits artificial intelligence, neurotechnology, and whatnot, uh, but not to the effect that we are sending them out of hands. We have even these warnings by people like Elon Musk and the uh, artificial intelligence community who are saying mm, international law should intervene and prohibit this stuff. At the same time, Elon Musk is massively investing into interfaces between the human body and computers uh, uh, with this company Neuralink. So I'm seeing that uh, being concerned about Terminator-like situations it doesn't mean that you can't take uh, a, a profound interest in uses of artificial intelligence in conjunction with the human or the human body. That permits you then to say to the lawyers, look, we still have an operator in the loop. So what I'm trying to, to, to show is that, well, this operator may be nominally in the loop, but not to an extent that is sufficient for the purposes of international Good. Basically, this was my very simple argument. If you have further questions on that, I would be very happy to respond, or if you have comments on that. Yes, please. Um, I have a question, and it is, um, how is the system we have now with darker um, this scenario we were portraying? And I'm just going to make a comment on why I'm asking this. I come from Colombia. Yeah. And I've been studying um, the conflict there yeah. Um, yeah, two years now. Um, and uh, I, I find it very difficult to see, uh, I find it very difficult to see your argument about how the international law is able to um, prosecute uh, when when humans are, all the humans are involved. Yeah. Because we have a conflict for, that has lasted for right. 50 years. Yeah. And, and I very much doubt that there won't be any prosecutions. Right. From, yeah. And why would that be? I, just to tease out the characteristics of that particular conflict, why would it be impossible to prosecute? Let's now assume that we're talking about war crimes committed in the that conflict. Why would it be impossible to prosecute? Because um, the state uh, is so strong mm. and it has used different um, uh, paramilitary 